Since software existed, so did software piracy and copy protection methods since almost as long. In the days before online DRM, there was not much that software publishers could do to prevent consumers from making as many copies of their purchase as they liked and sharing them with others. And since the origins, game software was at the forefront of this new battleground between pirates and publishers. The degree of vulnerability greatly depended on the support. If games on cartridges were largely copy-proof because of their intrinsic design, this was not the case at all for games on magnetic devices like tapes or discs. This type of support was highly vulnerable to piracy and needed a specific protection to be added. But in what form? This is when it becomes interesting. The challenge was to find a way to offer at least some degree of protection without adding too much to the price and without annoying the actual buyers. For games released in the 80s and early 90s, copy protection was mostly analog instead of software-based. Software developers and game creators tended to be extra inventive in their anti-piracy devices. Let's review a few gems from that era by browsing through my game collection. Some games used kinds of dongles for copy protection. A few others exploited specificities in the physical support, diskette, or tried to combine software and hardware defense capabilities to thwart even the most clever pirates. But the vast majority relied on good old plain paper, using more or less sophisticated systems, either dedicated cards, wheels, or simply the game manual. Lucasfilm games typically came with elegant, funny design devices, completely in line with the game topic. The Secret of Monkey Island came with a dial-a-pirate wheel. And Monkey Island 2, LeChuck's Revenge, followed the same concept with its Mix and Mojo Voodoo Ingredient Proportion Dial Wheel. To be allowed to play the game, you needed to rotate the wheels accordingly to the random combination as displayed on screen and to input the resulting code. Loom used another specifically designed system. Among the items contained in the game box was the Book of Patterns and a red transparent filter, which enabled to see through its otherwise undecipherable list of codes. When launching the game, you saw a random combination indicating a location to find in the book. Once you put the filter at this location, you decoded the right answer. The Last Crusade let you play Indiana Jones even during the copy protection process by making use of a transcription table. But even if you got past that, there was another level of copy protection. At an important part of the game, you read a set of inscriptions to get two possible descriptions of the Holy Grail that you needed to check in the Grail diary that came with the game. The diary was a collector's item, richly written and illustrated. Many owners of the game actually read the diary cover to cover, even before playing it. So interesting it was. Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis used a more conventional system, a random screen with three concentric rings showing a sun, moon, and volcano. You had to refer to the indicated part of the manual to align them as needed. Maniac Mansion had copy protection as an in-game puzzle and so had its successor, Day of the Tentacle, which required the player to configure a machine based on an image printed on a certain page of the manual. Similar images were printed on every page, and the player needed a certain number to look it up. Other titles from Lucasfilm games, like the two magnificent flight sims, Battle of Britain and Secret Weapons of the Luftwaffe, used the code wheel as copy protection. The wheels made the most of color usage to prevent photocopy, the usual workaround for pirating printed material. 
Ultima 6 introduced in-game questions, preventing the player from progressing any further in case of incorrect answers. These could be obtained by consulting the manual or the cloth map, which was hard to copy. Ultima 7 renewed this practice, although in both games the player had an unlimited number of tries to answer the questions correctly. F-19 Stealth Fighter used a mixed protection system, both technical and logical. First, it required the original disc even if the game was run from the hard drive. Then, at the beginning of the game, the player had to pass the aircraft identification exam, which presented a visual and required to select the correct plane from a list. If the wrong plane was selected, the game was restricted to flying training missions with preset equipment. Some games, like Civilization, made it relatively easy to escape the protection system since they expected rather obvious answers from a list of a few choices to the question, what do you need to achieve this improvement? Others, like Defender of the Crown or Captain Blood, used purely technical designs such as non-standard disc formats to defeat easy copy. As we can see, many game protections went far beyond in creativity than just require you to enter word X on line Y of page Z of the manual. But we've saved the best for the last. Almost like this was logical, the most advanced copy protection system was developed for the best game of all, Dungeon Master. It took several months after the first release of Dungeon Master on Atari ST before the copy protection was fully defeated. While most copy protections are defeated in a matter of hours or days by experienced hackers. This partially explains why it sold lots of copies. The main reason remaining, of course, that this was an awesome game. To the question, what's the best protection system you have ever seen? Many former hackers have the same answer. Dungeon Master. One of them says, It seemed to be written in some kind of interpreted language, which made it very difficult to fathom. It also had protection embedded throughout the game. Good protection is like good encryption. It can never be an afterthought. You can't buy it off the shelf. It has to be part of the fabric of the game. Apparently, it had a protection check after the final boss, just so you couldn't see the end sequence. Hats off to them. So, what was so special about Dungeon Master's copy protection? Let's see what the main programmer, Doug Bell, said about it. We had the advantage of owning the patent on a floppy disk copy protection scheme that required a $40,000 specialized hardware device to write the disks. It was impossible to create a disk image without this hardware, and the hardware itself was out of production. That meant that as long as there were enough layers on the copy protection, and these layers took long enough to crack, the only way to own the game was to buy it. The copy protection scheme took a couple of weeks to create, and while this added cost to the production without adding value for the customer, it was time well spent. 
the copy protection was based on many redundant, overlapping, and isolated checks and cross-checks. Dungeon Master had a greater than 50% market penetration on the Atari ST. That is, more than one copy of Dungeon Master was sold for each two Atari ST computers sold. That's easily 10 times the penetration of any other game of the time. So what's the lesson? That piracy does take significant money out of the pocket of the developer and that secure anti-piracy schemes are possible. Dungeon Master implemented several different copy protection schemes at once, preventing floppy disk copy, detecting non-original disks, and preventing software crack. Several techniques were used to place unusual things on the original floppy disks of Dungeon Master and its sequel, Chaos Strikes Back, to prevent easy disk copy. The main technique was the use of fuzzy bits, whose value randomly reads as 0 or 1, instead of having a fixed value as is normally the case. In order to check if the floppy disk was original, the game read the fuzzy bits several times and compared the results. If their value was different from one reading to another, then the disk was an original. If their value was always the same, then the disk was a copy. Dungeon Master read the copy protection sector containing the fuzzy bits periodically during gameplay. The detection of a single one with changing value was enough for the program to consider the disk as original. Cracking a program means modifying the program so as to lure its copy protection check. In the case of Dungeon Master, that meant removing or changing the test that checked for the presence of fuzzy bits. The designers knew that software pirates would try to crack their games, so they included a lot of tricks to make their task as difficult as possible. Many copy protection checks required a single test, usually at the beginning of the game. It was relatively easy for pirates to find and remove such tests. In the case of Dungeon Master and Chaos Strikes Back, the developers put several checks for the presence of fuzzy bits at various places in the program. For a good crack, you needed to find and defeat them all. In order to make things even harder, the designers put some hidden code pieces in the graphical data. These routines were encoded just like normal images. At some points while you played, these hidden code pieces were decoded in memory, executed, and then cleaned from memory. A pirate looking only at the main program would miss them. Finally, Dungeon Master used checksums at several places in the program to ensure that the program itself had not been tampered with. If a pirate changed something in the code to remove part of the copy protection, then the checksum of the program also changed, so the program could itself detect the change and know that it had been cracked. All these techniques were followed by one of the most clever inventions, delayed results to failed tests. In many games, the copy protection checks immediately returned an error when a copy was detected. But in Dungeon Master, when some of the multiple copy protection tests failed, the game continued normally. You could keep playing for some time, but ultimately, you would face the consequences in one way or another. If the game detected a copied disk or that the program was modified, then it could produce different effects, immediate or delayed ranging from simple hindering to complete crash with various degrees in between. This wide range of possibilities complicated even further the cracking process. All these different devices and effects ensured that pirates could not immediately know if the crack they made was working fine. It required lots of testing and time and very careful inspection of what the program was doing. This made the cracking process a lot harder. Copy protection was one of the main reasons for game publishers to dedicate special efforts to printed instruction manual and additional booklets. It also made it more enticing for players to own the game by including awesome physical goods in the package. The downside to this form of copy protection was that if you ever lost any of these goods, manuals, or wheels, you'd render your game unplayable. This led to the rapid decline of such techniques as soon as more sophisticated, technology-based copy protection schemes were found. It's interesting to look back on a time when game publishers occasionally found solutions that gave the consumer some notable benefits to make up for the inconvenience of copy protection schemes. I hope you enjoyed this video. To keep the passion burning, 
subscribe to Retro Dream.